his um he was in charge of uh the UFO investigation at Wright Field from uh night to middle of fifty one till uh uh the end of fifty three. Um but the, excuse me, the middle of fifty three. So for about two years he was uh he was the the head of uh, Project Blue Book. Now this was a time when uh the uh his superiors or let's put it this way the pentagon was um, more open minded on ufos they had a a, a a short period there where they decided that uh, let's just look at these like we haven't looked at them before why did he uh, die at age 37 that's awful. yeah he died very young he wow. died very young and uh, I talked to one of the people that worked for him, and he said that he's not. Uh, they were not. Uh, he was not surprised that Rupelt died young because he said this was a a type A personality. He was very um, um, so. It, it's unfortunate, that, you know, that he didn't live uh, later on in the because he they probably would have had better. Uh, medical chances of living but uh you know he he died uh when we didn't uh you know uh, didn't have a lot of treatment for heart problems sounds very uh curious he died yeah, so he, in uh, california yeah so uh, he uh he, he after he got, after he got out of the service um he decided to write a a, a, uh, a book on his uh, experiences with UFOs because it was it was quite interesting and Keo had wrote written uh, flying saucers are real and flying saucers from outer space both which were very good sellers so Rupelt added his book which was the inside story and uh it wasn't a best seller but it was it did pretty good it did fairly well he uh uh first he wrote for true magazine he got two thousand dollars for true magazine he said that was a down payment on his house wow so they say he died of a heart attack with no one really knowing i guess if a fatal heart attack but that's what they said right that Edward Rupert died at age 39 from a heart attack, 37. Yeah. And you read his book, and that's what got you on the interest. That's in what got me started, and I started reading other things. And um, the other thing was that in uh, in junior high, and pr- probably the reason I read his book, this, this happened about the same time. Um uh during the christmas vacation i was uh uh i had uh we had a, uh, a snowstorm and i had shoveled the walk and i was uh, getting ready to make it in the oven i was getting ready to make myself some cinnamon toast after i came in to warm up and uh it's one of those winter storms where you had lightning and thunder and I'm I'm by the electric stove, and I had there there was a radio on the electric stove, um, and uh, our chimney got hit by uh, lightning. And when it did, there was there was a big spark that jumped across the uh, the top of the stove, and the radio went nuts. And it it was still going nuts. Uh, it was it just static and everything. Nothing. Uh, broadcast was interrupted, and I I didn't know what it was. It was you know, so I wanted to see if the oven was affected somehow by this 
lightning strike. So I open up the oven, and inside the oven there's this little ball of light about as big as a quarter. Um, sitting not on the grate, but just above the grate in the, uh, in the oven. And when I opened the door, it started to roll end over end. It wasn't touching the grate. It just rolled end over end to the, uh, to the end of the grate and then sort of fell off and exploded. So I think that's how I got interested in UFOs because of this thing. <laughs> Because when my father came home, and he was a chemist, and he, you know, um, I asked him about this thing. I mean, it scared the hell out of me. It knocked me on my backside. It was yes. like a, it was like a, a, a cherry bomb going off inside the house. It was so loud, the explosion. So it scared the heck out of me. So then... My father got home, and I said, you know, Dad, do you know what this is? And he said, no. He said, that's what the library's for. Oh. So so I so went down to the, the library. library. <laughs> yeah, so I went down to the library and looked at, looked up. Um, I found out that this phenomenon was called ball lightning. Wow. And uh, it's said in the Encyclopedia Britannica that uh, most scientists did not believe it existed. Oh, so I tried to read, cool. yeah, so I tried to read everything I could on it. There were magazine articles and scientific magazine articles and uh, reports in the, um, uh, in the, in the uh, newspapers and magazines, but they seemed to end about uh, in the 30s. Somebody had written a ball, uh, an article on ball lightning that said there was nothing to it. That there, it was caused by, he had a whole, whole list of things that caused it. And so if you ever see a UFO debunking book, that's what this article was. It debunked ball lightning. Okay. And uh, some, of the, some of the same uh, explanations he gave are some of the same explanations for UFOs. So then I started reading about, I read Rupelt's book, and I recognized that, hey, this guy, his name was Humphreys. He was a meteorologist for the Weather Bureau. And uh, because of his article, ball lightning disappeared from the scientific press for almost until the uh, late 50s. People didn't write articles about it and stuff. So you were yeah, always I mean, searching it, as an investigative reporter in your own mind or research because you wanted to find out what was causing it, right? You were Yeah, right. Real so then I read, I read about UFOs, and it seemed like the same thing was happening with UFOs, that they weren't looking at it seriously enough, and they were just like Humphreys. People were coming up for with explanations that didn't didn't fit too well. So that's uh, and it, like I said, this both happened about the same time. So I can't say which which one. I you know it's hard for me to figure out you know remember which one was was the most uh, inspiring. But I, I kind of think that the ball lightning got me started and. Then I read Rupelt's book, and I said, yeah, well, the same thing's happening with UFOs. So Now, did uh, he was working with the Air Force Intelligence Headquarters at the time? He was working with uh, Air Technical Intelligence. And what they did out there is uh, they would try to get pieces of enemy or uh, hostile aircraft uh, or get hostile aircraft itself, you know, planes that crash and stuff, and evaluate them. That was the main uh, function out there, is to uh, keep ahead of developments uh, uh, in the, uh, the that would affect the uh, Air Force. So it was air technical intelligence, which is about, you know, actual pieces of things. Um, so when they got the UFO problem, I mean, these are people that 
these are engineers and things. They they, they want to work with things that they can touch and feel, and UFOs is not one of those things. Uh, but that's what he, yes, he worked there. And uh, uh, as a as a first lieutenant, he was a, he had a major's job, which is rather surprising. And he wasn't a uh, he had experience in the Second World War as an enlisted man, but he was a brand new officer when he went to uh, Wright Patterson. He was a reserve officer called up to the Korean War. So when he went to Wright Patterson, uh, he, uh, he he was he was a brand new officer. He didn't he uh, he had military experience, but he didn't have a lot of officer experience. Now he got in touch with a Long Beach writer, didn't he? When they put out a article on him in True Magazine. He got in touch with the well, he got writer. in he got in touch with uh with the uh, editors of True. Um Jim Fellon, wasn't it? Yeah, Jim Fellon wrote articles about him in the uh in the California press. Okay. Uh he got in he, uh uh and he wrote a uh an article for um True magazine, and it was rather skeptical, and uh, and uh, the uh, editor told him, uh, uh, "You should make this uh, less. You should make this more uh, n- uh, n- not negative, but you should uh, more middle of the road." So that's what he did. Uh, and, uh, that's, that was his first thing. And, uh, like I said, he got $2,000, which at the time was a lot of money. Oh, it wasn't wow. like it is today. $2,000 was a lot of money for, for that article. So that's, that went for, uh, for a down payment of his home, which at the time, you know, homes didn't cost that much. Now, who was Professor Swords or Swords? Helped him with his Swords, he's a, he is a, he is the uh, uh, professor at uh, Western Michigan University. Uh, yeah. uh, one of the things he's or he was interested in is environmental science sciences. Um, uh, later on, he became. Uh, uh, one of the um, important uh, people in Kufos, one of the, because they had a lot of scientists that, uh, Mark Rodiger and uh, Swords and Valet, they all, uh, you know, they were all in, Ku, you know, Kufos, helping behind oh, out. Okay, they did Kufos. Were they some of the original founders of Kufos? Well, uh, Swords. Uh, Swords wasn't a founder, but uh, he came in later. I don't think Rodiger was a founder. He came in later. Um, there were a number of UFO people that that, that helped Heinrich start out. Uh, Sherm Larson was uh, head of the NICAP uh, uh, Chicago affiliate, and then he uh, helped out... Uh, uh, Heineck get established and start out, and uh, he actually uh, got the uh, NICAP files. Uh, so he had the NICAP files in his office. Uh, um, another Kufos member bought bought the uh, NICAP files. Well, so you know. Yeah, I mean the the NICAP the NIC, the NICAP files were uh, sitting in a warehouse for uh, uh, maybe uh, five or six years. So who knows? Uh, oh wow! Um, so 
so when and 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 when and when they were sold, um, the 